Well, good morning, everyone. Well, we already have been worshiping. I hope you're ready to continue. I want you to turn in your scripture to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I'm a bit on a uh, spiritual high this morning. Last night, we were at Trip McConnell University celebrating our second annual Faith and Freedom event. That's uh, where we uh, raise scholarship uh, dollars for our students, but honor the Lord in doing so and honor our uh, country, as it were, being very patriotic. And uh, yesterday, we had Governor Mike Huckabee on campus and about 1,200 friends, and it was just a marvelous night where the Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up. And uh, Drew McConnell has just become that type of place that I hope you realize if you ever become a pessimist by what's happened in this generation, just drive on up a few hours, uh, maybe on a Tuesday morning. And it'll be a chapel service around 930, and you'll get to see hundreds and hundreds of students just worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be a pessimist. It's not the era to be a pessimist. In fact, I just get really flustered by it because, you know, uh, people look to the wrong things for hope, I think. Uh, A lot of people look to politics to somehow bring about revival. That's an odd thing to me, a really odd thing to me because if you know what politics is, just think about the word, poly and ticks, (laughs) many blood-sucking creatures. Politics can't bring about revival, but here's the good news. Politics can't stop revival either. The future of our nation will reside upon the altars of our church across this nation as we trust in the Lord. It will rise and fall upon the remnant of faithful believers who will be praying for our nation, standing for truth, and living faithfully for the Lord Jesus Christ. And for now, 11 years I've been at True McConnell, I still can't believe the Lord lets me do what I'm doing. I just can't. I, I don't know why. There were a thousand people more qualified to leave the university than me. My only qualification is I graduated in the top 10% of the bottom half of my class. <laughs> and so I am at True McConnell University. I can tell you, I just love it. I can't believe the Lord lets me do this every day and sends out people everywhere. And if you have a son or daughter or grandchild, And you're wondering what piece of advice would be most beneficial to them when it comes to seeking out the Lord's will for the next steps. And if that may be college, I'd recommend just one piece of advice, and it's this crucial one. Do not assume that where you're talented, you're called. Assume that where you're called, God will talent you. There's a massive difference between the two. Students get to the end of their high school life, They look at their grades, they see what they have got high skills at and what they don't, and they simply think that that's their entire future when God dreams far bigger and desires much better than simply that which is on a page. And I tell you, because I'm a testament of that in some ways, and I want to share with you a bit of my story, but I want to do through an exposition of our scripture. So in your scripture this morning, you are in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and you will be starting with verse 2. We'll read just a few verses this morning and what the Jewish people called the Messianic Deliverance Passage. Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 2. The Scripture says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Now note the word joy in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. Men rejoice when they divide the spoils. You see it there. And then running to a climax, the reason why is found in verse 4. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors in the day of Midian, from every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle. And the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. And as if all the limelight is shined upon two and a half chapters of this Messianic deliverance passage, the announcement is finally given. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called. And here are four couplets, two words in the Hebrew language, put together 
to announce the coming Messiah. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Ultimate question in life is who is Jesus? The good news, as we will celebrate here in a few weeks, is you don't have to prove Jesus. Jesus proved himself. We are but mere ambassadors to the one and only Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The very picture of who Jesus is has been answered. But there's a second question in life that everybody must answer, and that's simply this, who is Jesus to you? You see, my my father is Turkish, my mother is Swedish, my wife's from the Czech Republic, and that is the reason why we have a psychology department at True McConnell, (laughs) because our children will need it one day. And my father studied at the University of Stockholm. He went over there, met my mother. My mother converted to Islam. It doesn't take much to become a Muslim. It doesn't even guarantee you heaven to become a Muslim. You just say what's called the Shahada, the, the creed of Islam. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And you're on your journey to Islam. And my mother, who was raised Christian, converted to become a Muslim. And then we immigrated here to the United States in 1969. I was born in 1970. I love to remind my brothers of that, both of whom were born overseas, because you know what that means. I can be president. (laughs) They can't. They can be governor of California if they're judged by God. And um, we immigrated here for two reasons. There's an economic freedom that no other country in the world has beyond us. But secondly, uh, my father was here to share his faith and plant a mosque, and certainly he did so. You see, back in the 1960s, there were barely 100 mosques in America. Now we're moving towards 3,000 mosques in America. But I'll tell you what I'm grateful for, because as my father taught me of Jesus, I wasn't taught of the true Jesus. I was taught of a false Jesus. If you want to know in one statement what Islam is compared to Christianity, a lot of people try to find similarities between the two. But listen to me, Islam is the complete repudiation of Christianity. And and let me show you what I mean. If you were blessed to be raised in church and I wasn't, but thank God my children are, you at some point run across John 3.16 in vacation Bible school and in Sunday schools and so forth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's what the Quran says in chapter 112 and verse 3. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There is none like him. If you're raised in church and you're raised in a Christian family, at some point in your life you heard Jesus call out to you like Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But in the Quran, chapter 35, and verse 18 says you've got to bear your own burdens. No one can bear them for you. In the Quran, Jesus is created, not the creator. And listen to this verse from chapter 4 and verse 157 of the Quran. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was someone like him. See, I was taught of Jesus, but I was taught of a false Jesus from a false prophet named Muhammad and a false God I worship named Allah until an obnoxious teenager shared Jesus with me. And he wasn't merely persistent, he was obnoxious. And I thank God that in the realm, he had no idea about Islam, but boy, he wouldn't give up on us. He invited us to every little event a Southern Baptist church had. We resided in Columbus, Ohio, and he invited us to things I'd never heard of before, a lock-in. I'd never heard of a lock-in. You know, you've heard of lock-ins. I can hear the groaning. It is in the Bible. You can find a lock-in in the Bible. Just look under the word hell, you will find a lock-in somewhere. But that young, and I want you to hear the thesis that's so crucial. It doesn't take someone who knows Muhammad well to win someone to Jesus who's a Muslim. It takes someone who knows Jesus well to win someone who's Jesus, even if they're a Muslim. I thankfully was introduced because, you know, the greatest sin in Islam is to partner anything or anyone with God. Anything or anyone with God. Do you remember when Peter was stepped out on his faith in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they bantered about, oh, well, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, and some say one of the prophets. And finally Jesus paused because this wasn't a cultural discussion that would have an end to it. 
And he looked them in the eye, the ones who've been following him 24-7, 365. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And the brash Peter stands up and says, you're the Christ. But what follows that? The Son of the living God. That is the cornerstone, the Apostle Paul says, of the Christian faith. The Lord Jesus Christ, the confession in him and his finished work on the cross. But in Islam, it's the highest and most heinous sin and it will send you to the lowest levels of hell. But I tell you today, I stand before you without any reservation, without any regret, and I declare to you, he is the Son of God. And it's not because I declared it, but because he first came to me and introduced himself to me. He introduced himself as the wonderful counselor. Now let's go back in time, about 2,700 years. You come to the time of the prophet Isaiah. There are messianic passages throughout the Old Testament It begins with Genesis chapter 3, after the fall. Immediately after the fall, there is the introduction of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Introduced again in the prototype of uh, uh, Genesis chapter 22 with Abraham and Isaac. And on throughout the scripture, you see it. But you get to this vitally important passage. It actually begins in Isaiah chapter 7. It ends where we finished in Isaiah chapter 9. The Jewish people were asking How can I know the coming Messiah? The first way you can come to know the Messiah that was to come is Isaiah 7, chapter 4, verse 14 says, He shall be born of a virgin. Hear me carefully. The first time I heard someone deny the virgin birth was not when I was a Muslim. They affirmed the virgin birth. The first time I heard someone deny the virgin birth was when I was a Christian. And I ran into liberal pastors and liberal professors who would say things like this. Well, the the virgin birth's not that important. It's only mentioned a few times in the Scripture, and therefore you don't have to believe it. But Isaiah chapter 7 says, He shall be born of a virgin, and that's how you'll know the coming Messiah. And if the Messiah isn't born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, he is not the wonderful counselor, the Almighty God, and the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace of Isaiah chapter 9. A denial of the virgin birth of Jesus is a denial of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I was introduced to the wonderful counselor. You and I use the word wonderful. I hope if you're an encourager, you talk to someone and they're a wonderful person and then a wonderful thing. But the word wonderful has an explicit meaning in the Old Testament. Never once is the word wonderful used of a mere mortal. Never once can you find in 39 books of the Scripture of the Old Testament the word wonderful point out to a human being alone. Instead, the word wonderful was a connotation to the divine. So, for example, when the Jewish people were about to go to war, they pause to pray before they go to war, and they look up to the Lord, and they say, but Lord, before this war, whom shall we say sent us? And the Lord looked at them and said, tell them, wonderful, sent you. Now, picture being that Jewish boy, that Jewish girl, being raised, as it were, in the Jewish faith, and they're looking for the coming Messiah, the forgiveness of their sins. And they come across this passage, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor. Two questions in life everybody asks. Is there a God? Does he speak? And in one answer, he is wonderful, there is a God, he's counselor, he does speak. One person, one prototype, the beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the wonderful counselor. How do the Jewish people know the living word of God to come? But they trusted the written word of God, which came to them. That's why when we speak of the Scripture, we speak of it as we speak of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author of Scripture. As Jesus Christ is perfect, so too is his word perfect. That's why we say things like the the Scripture is inerrant. There are no mistakes in it. From Genesis to Revelation, you can trust the word of God, and not merely on Sundays, but all throughout the week. We say it is infallible. Fallibility is a bit different, but it means this. It'll never lead you astray. If you came in here this morning and you were hurting, something personal or something professional is happening, nobody knows it but you, and you're just wrestling. And, and you come to your pastor, one of your pastors, and you say, I, I don't, I, I'm just shaken to the core. Where should I look in the Scripture 
to, to find an answer. The answer any one of these pastors will tell you is just open it up. He's there. From Leviticus to Luke, from Hosea to Hebrew, from Genesis to Revelation, he, he's there. He'll speak. He'll never lead you astray. Can I tell you the greatest danger about Islam? The greatest danger is not Israel versus Palestine. Important subject, not the ultimate. The greatest danger is not Mujahideen and Jihad. It's not holy war and holy warriors. Important, but not the ultimate. The greatest danger is there are 1.8 billion Muslims on earth, and Jesus Christ died for every last one of them, but they're being led astray. Led astray by a false god, false prophet, false book, and false hope that somehow you can work your way to heaven. Led astray like I was being led astray. Led astray like most of my family are still being led astray. But for the wonderful counselor. But don't miss this. Wonderful counselor is also a picture that this word is intimate. I believe the greatest danger in America today is that the Bible has become a resource on the table and not a treasure for the heart. Intimacy means this is God's love letter to you and to me. This is how he speaks and he guides and he directs on a daily and intimate basis. I told you my wife was Czech. We met on a mission trip. Uh, I was headed to the Czech Republic. Czech Republic today is one of the most atheistic countries in all of the world. 71% deny any existence of God. In fact, in youth, only 9% believe there is a God. And so we were there. We wanted to show Jesus film in the Czech language. And I was on the southern border near Austria. And I'm in a hotel. And we got the Jesus film set up. And I'm supposed to speak for a few minutes. And, and uh, I'm waiting. Obviously, I don't speak Czech. So I wait for my translator. And up she comes. Uh, she's now my wife. And in biblical terms, she was hot. And so <laughs> I lost it. My mind went blank. It's never good for a preacher to not know what to say. So I reverted back to my Turkish culture. I looked at her and said, how you doing? (laughs) And, hey, we dated for one week and got married. Yep, I wasn't expecting it either. I was happily the president of Butter, bachelors until the rapture. I was not looking for a wife. I wasn't looking for a date. We are on a mission trip, but isn't it wonderful when God has a much better plan than you do? And you say, well, look, a a, a week? Yeah, I know. I've got two daughters now. I know. They ever tried that? I've got enough jihad in my bones to make sure that doesn't happen. I know. You say, how did you make the most important decision in life? Minus salvation Marriage, the most important decision in life. Anyone who's married knows this fact. If you have a great marriage, man, there's nothing like it. If you have an awful marriage, there is nothing like it. (laughs) How do you make that decision? Well, we met in January. It was platonic, right? We were there for a mission trip to share to the Lord. And I flew back over there in March, and we dated for a week and then announced our wedding. Six weeks in between that. Six weeks. Start to know each other between January and March. We wrote each other. During that time, I wrote my wife 300 letters. I know. Psychologists say I suffer from aggravated epistolary compulsion. I love to write. I do. It's my release mechanism. And I I had questions, right? When were you saved? Which thought about ministry since I'm in ministry, family, anything. Ladies, I, I ask questions that women think are unimportant. They're not unimportant. What do you like to eat? Not unimportant to a man. Swedish is my first language. English, my second language. Four most important words I've ever learned. All you can eat. (laughs) Anybody knows me knows I'm not an omnivore. I'm a carnivore. Vegetable isn't a food. Vegetable is what food eats. And I just want to see if she'd hunker down at the Golden Corral and eat with me at the trough for a while. She had some questions for me, too. You see, my name, pronounced in Turkish, is Amir Fetijaner. It means the prince of Islamic conquest. She had some questions for me. But before I ever got over for that one week, I already knew I loved her. I already knew I wanted to spend my life with her. Before I saw her face to face again, I saw her heart on the page. 
and with our Lord. Can you not declare with full confidence you already love him? But how dare you say that statement? Because he first loved us. And he gave himself to be a propitiation for our sin. He's the wonderful counselor. Secondly, he is El Gabor, the almighty God, God the hero. Go back this 2,700 years. Imagine being this Jewish boy. He's learning the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament with his daddy. Oh, he gets the creation account, Genesis 1, 2, the fall, Genesis 3. Cain kills Abel, Genesis 4. Enoch walks with God and is not, Genesis 5. And they walk through the entirety of Genesis. They get to Exodus. They get to chapter 20. It's the Ten Commandments. And the boy just stops for a second. His daddy's teaching through them. You know the Ten Commandments. Top four, your relationship with the Lord. Bottom six, your relationship with others. Finally, the boy says, Dad, stop. I'm done. I don't want to read anymore. You see, Dad, I know what they are, and I know the Lord says you've got to line up in perfect righteousness with me, and I can't do that, and I've broken that commandment, and I've broken that commandment, and I've broken that commandment, and Dad, there's no hope for me. I'm done. His his father says, but hold on a second, son. I want you to flip on over to Isaiah 9 for just one moment. I want you to see words you've repeated all your life, but you've never repeated them together, only separately. All right, Dad, just one more, one more verse. See, the son, the word El, yeah, Dad, El is Elohim, El Shaddai, El, I know that's God. You see the other word? Gabor, yeah, Dad, I know, military hero. Well, hold on a second, son. Those two words are put together in a messianic deliverance passage. You see, son, This coming Messiah is God, your hero. You see, son, this coming Messiah is not coming to make a bad man good. He's coming to make a dead man alive. That little boy bows by the bedside and places his faith in the coming Messiah in the same way this young man did the same on the other side of the cross. I walked into the Stelzer Road Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. I was raised in Columbus. That does make me a Buckeye fan. Don't get mad at me for that. It's not like we're intimidating. We're the Buckeyes, not the Bulldogs, not the Yellow Jackets. We picked a Buckeye. Do you know what a Buckeye is? It's a useless nut. We're the Ohio State useless nuts. That's what we chose. I walked into this church. Now, listen, I raised up north. I had no idea what a Southern Baptist was. None. You had a stereotype, by the way. Southern Baptists are people who handle snakes and eat squirrels. That's a Southern Baptist. Look, I've been one for 30 plus years now. You know it's half true whenever you meet someone. And I walked to the church terrified. I wasn't terrified because I was a Muslim. I was comfortable in my theological skin. I knew who I was. I was terrified because it was the awkward teenage years. Do you remember your teenage years? I'd rather forget my teenage years. Went to a public school of about 2,000 students. I wasn't a nerd. I was the nerd in my school. I promise you. I was skinny and scrawny and geeky in every way. I was going towards six foot tall. I was barely 100 pounds I was the kid who could stick out my tongue, turn to the side, look like a zipper. I was that kid. I, pro- I was the kid who a lot of friends, they all had the same first name, imaginary. That was my life. I was the kid who tried out for every sport. I said, man, I just going to be part of a team. I'm going to try it out for sports. I didn't make one sport. Not one team invited me to stay. I tried out for golf. I figured a Muslim would be good out of the sand. I couldn't even make the golf team. But you know, you know this, this type of student, don't you? I was always in the corner. The corner of the Sunday school, the corner of the cafeteria, the corner of the neighborhood. My only goal in life was just, just don't notice me. I don't want to look anybody in the eye. I don't want to be noticed. I'll just be over here. 
And then this young man invited me to church, and I thought, I don't know about this. I know how they treat me at the school. They're going to treat me the same way here. But for the first time in my life when I walked to that church, I saw and I heard the unconditional love of Jesus. Do you want to know the great dividing line between every religion and Christianity? It's not love. It's unconditional love. Other religions have love. Islam in the Quran says it this way, Allah loves those who do righteous deeds. But then listen to this, Allah hates sinners. How radically different is Romans chapter 5 that God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And not only would I hear it, I saw it. I came in the back door. Older ladies met me and said things I had never heard in a mosque. Let me hug your neck. Never been said in a mosque. I promise you. <laughs> youth came up. They, they would sit, youth would sit right around here. It was a small church, just two uh, rows there. And they sat in the front and they said, man, why don't you come sit with us? I was stunned because it wasn't fake. It wasn't a facade of any sort. Who they were on Sunday, they were on Monday. And for the first time in my life, I had friends. And man, if you think the people in a pew are unique, preachers in Southern Baptist life are an eccentric bunch. Oh, back then, my pastor was an old-fashioned preacher. You all remember old-fashioned preachers? You could tell it by the way they looked. My pastor wore a leisure suit, green with red stitching. He wore half zip-up boots. I'd never seen zip-up boots with white tube socks on. And he didn't say you had to be born again with a T, right? Not born again the way it's supposed to be spelled in the actual English language. No, you have to be born again. He could spit to the fourth row without even trying. It was like a shower section where you would sit. He was an ex-moonshiner who got saved. No joke. A clear mason jar with all that clear liquid in it. That's what his job was. He raised in the mountains of Kentucky. Korean War vet. Stationed in Tokyo. He meets his wife, a Buddhist woman. She gets saved before he does. He gets saved, and there we are. He looks at me dead in the eye and says, what do you think about Jesus? Now listen, Muslims will tell you, we respect Jesus. Here's your problem. No one can respect Jesus. No one. Jesus declared himself God. You can't simply respect him. You have two options. You bow and worship, or you get up and walk away. That night I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and as quickly as I could, I ran forward and placed my faith in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Lord Jesus. And I went home free. And I went home to tell my mother, my mother who converted to Islam, but by this time she had been disgruntled with much of religion. But mom was just motherish. She told me to do my homework and go to bed. She didn't get it because it didn't make any difference to her. Then I told more and more, more and more Swedish, her grandma. More and more literally sold everything in Sweden, put all the money to come here so we can simply put food on the table as an immigrant family. More and more, if you want to know, is a pluralist. Now, a pluralist is not hard to understand. Anyone who cooks in here and cooks a gumbo, that's a pluralist soup. You know, you just take a little bit of everything and you put it together till you get a good taste. That's gumbo and that's a pluralist. Grandma took every religion under the sun and put it together. A little sprig of Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and Christianity and everything she could find. And she thought there was where religion was found. I'll never forget witnessing a grandma saying, Grandma, don't you believe Jesus died for you? She said, oh, I absolutely believe that. And when I'm reincarnated, I'll understand more. That was my more more. But where I learned the third of four personal attributes of our Lord here, it's when I had to tell my daddy. On a Friday evening, we sat down. He asked us to pray. And I couldn't. I could never bow my knee to another God again. But how do you tell your father? How do you tell the man you want him to look like and to speak like and be like? How, how do you tell him? You can't, you won't. 
There's no possible rational way. Only if the Spirit of God takes over that situation is it possible. So trembling, I looked up. I said, Dad, I can't. He said, why? I said, I've become a Christian. Remember what I told you? The highest and most heinous sin in Islam is to partner anyone with God. And I just told my father, Jesus is the Son of God. His reaction was swift. He said, you choose this day between a new religion of yours and me. But there's little choice in that matter. Always, always, always choose Jesus. And don't look at it from the world's view. Look at it from the Scripture. That day was a very, very good day. Any day you obey Jesus, regardless of the consequences, is a good day. Remember, Jesus calls out his disciples, the two brothers first, and then the list of the other eight. And the last thing he says to them at the end of the chapter is, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And I will separate son from father and daughter from mother. I had done nothing special. I had done what millions before me had done, millions after me have done. What you and I are called to do every day in here, simply obey Jesus wherever you're found. It was a good day. It was a good day. Because I got to share Jesus with my father once. And hear me carefully. I would rather share Jesus with my father once and lost him than never share Jesus at all and kept him. It was a good day. Got in that little Chevy Chevette, drove to my mother's home, and I heard God speak. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. It's the beautiful picture of our Lord. There are no orphans in the house of God. It is Jesus himself who said in John chapter 10, no one will snatch you out of my hand. It's what I needed to mature as a believer. Because five years later, I heard a different call and a call I refused. I didn't want any part of. It didn't make any sense to me. It was a call to preach. I didn't want to be a preacher. Preachers lose their hair. I didn't <laughs> want, look at, I didn't plan this. <laughs> I looked like a Q-tip. I didn't plan, I looked like a love child between a Saudi woman and Mr. Clean. I didn't want this. But you know why I didn't want it. I couldn't look anybody in the eye. I was a kid in the corner. I just didn't want to be noticed by anyone. And God said, you preach. And here's the only thing I knew. I told the Lord two things. God, you are sovereign and God, you are wrong. That is an awful place. But I'm telling you, just honestly, I wrestled month after month after month after month. And I learned a valuable lesson. You cannot be joyful in this life if you're not obedient in this life. So I came forward. Pastor Clarence was there again. Same man who led me to Christ. Same man who baptized me. Here I was again. It's a little Muslim kid. The pastor, Clarence, I, uh, I'm called to preach. He said, I know. <laughs> he always knew. And, and uh, that little church of 80 people called out more than a dozen pastors. Unbelievable little church. And I was terrified because I knew what was next. He'd turn you around. He'd put his army around you. He said, Brother Emar, never got my name right. Brother Emar has been called to preach, and I hope you'll come back tonight. <laughs> to hear him preach. Those are the words of a terrorist. I promise you. <laughs> Man, I went home sweating bullets, right? I'm, I'm trying everything. I come back. I have a passage. Here's my passage for the night. Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. I've got my passage. <laughs> Worst sermon in the history of Christianity. I promise you. I, there were heretics that got offended by me. I mean, just the worst. You, you know what I'm thankful for? No YouTube. You can't prove it. I know it was bad. You know how you had a bad sermon? Any pastor can tell you this. Here's how you know you had a bad sermon. You're in the back. You're shaking people's hands. Older ladies come up to you. They've been saved for decades. They're not lying to a holy God for your benefit. <laughs> so they come up, they reach out their hand, and they say in Greek, bless your heart. <laughs> Which is from the original language, I don't know why I showed up, but bless your heart. I heard a hundred times that night, there were 30 people there. It was, uh, I knew I needed to be mentored. I knew I needed to be educated. God calls me to Texas. 
I'd never been to Texas. Y'all ever lived in Texas? Anyway, I mean, you, you, know, you know how flat Texas is, right? You could watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> it's like crazy. And God says, you go to Texas. And I wasn't going to say no again. I learned the hard way the first time. A couple weeks before I left, my mother, where I was serving as a youth director, came forward and placed her faith in Jesus. Man, I could have floated to Texas. Finished up my education in time. Began teaching at one of our seminaries. Second day I'm teaching. Second day I am teaching. One of my brothers calls me and says, Dad's dying of prostate cancer. But he wants to see you. I couldn't believe it. I'd been disowned for a total of 14 years. He wanted to see me. You can imagine how quickly I drove up to Columbus, Ohio. You can imagine how amazing the reconciliation was. All I could think in my head later was, you know, I could have done things in my time and my way, and I'd have got what my strength could give me. Where I could do things in God's time and His way, and I'll get the blessings that only He can give me. Because I walked into that house, and we hugged and we reconciled, and it was one of the most extraordinary moments of my life. But then we sat down, and He handed me a Quran and hoped I would revert back to Islam. I was hoping He would become a believer. He wouldn't let the name of Jesus be mentioned. He wouldn't let a Bible in his home. And he dies four days later. What do you do in the most difficult times of life? We all wrestle with them. No one's immune from them. The last couplet, three words in English, two words in Hebrew, you declaring Jesus the Prince of Peace. You know no one has been so oppressed as the Jewish people. There's group after group that has tried to eradicate them throughout their history. They they knew they had to seek the coming Messiah to find peace in their lives. In the same way, if you want peace in your life, the best thing you can do is to seek the coming of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Prince of Peace was a declaration of his coming. Prince of Peace to us is a declaration that government will be upon his shoulder. There will be a day that Jesus Christ will rule and reign forever. Prince of Peace. The same year I, um, I buried my father, I buried my grandmother. But more and more was a different story. More and more was almost 80 years old when I was saved. She went through the typical maladies of life, heart attacks and strokes and things of this nature. She ended up in a nursing home in Chicago while I was a seminary student in North Carolina. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, that woman that gave up everything so you can put food on the table, your turn to take care of her. Not hard. She's our hero. But I lived in the country. And I'm not talking country. I'm talking country. My brother and I pastored in Wood, North Carolina, exact population, 118 people. It's on the sign. Unless someone gets pregnant and we change the sign, 118 people, Wood, North Carolina, country. I thought, Lord, are you sure? My grandma is a city slicker, right? She's from Stockholm, Sweden. Are you sure you want her down here? When we got there, my brother and I, they invited us to an event I'd never heard of before, pig picking. I didn't know what a pig picking was. Been a Muslim half my life, so I had some catching up to do on some pork. So I went to a pig picking. You don't know what a pig picking is. Have you ever been to one? Man, they roast a pig overnight. It's a pretty cruel thing to do to a pastor because you can smell it from the back of the church. And he's supposed to preach. You might as well just shut up and eat the pig. (laughs) And he gets done preaching. You go out back, and that's your lunch. And, man, all the ladies bring the fixing and the trimmings and everything and desserts going along with it. And you go out back, and I'm thinking, Lord, this, are you sure you want Grandma here? I mean, I go up to this pig, and I'm looking at this pig, and the pig's looking back at me. You should have warned me about that. <laughs> Lord, are you sure? It, just, just one thing, Lord. My grandma doesn't speak English. The, the people of Wood, North Carolina, barely speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but you ever have the Lord just say, trust me? Just trust me. And you do. Moved Grandma down. Those sweet people, the Wood Baptist Church. Man, they didn't know a lick of Swedish. Grandma didn't know any English, but they loved her to Jesus. 
And I was going to walk out on a Wednesday night. I was going to teach the youth, and she stops me. I'd witnessed a thousand times. She stopped me, and she said, I want to know the same Jesus you know. And at the age of 92, she placed her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, as long as there's breath in the body, there's hope for the soul. And boy, we were excited at Wood Baptist Church because what's next? Baptism. Hold them down to they bubble, right? This is an important thing for us. The beautiful symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We got to do this right. And to do it right, we were a country church defined by one question, inside or outside. Anybody here baptized outside in the living waters? Yeah. You know why they call it the living waters? Because they're living things. In the living waters, our deacons used to proceed us into the pond and slap sticks on top of the water, right? You know what they're doing, moving anything dangerous, anything poisonous, snakes, snapping turtles, other deacons, whatever's there, they're removing. (laughs) And it's November, it's becoming winter, don't own a portable defibrillator, can't do this to my more more. So we waited and God calls me to Texas to pastor. Second Sunday I'm there, I get to baptize my hero. Man, have you ever had a day in your life where you went, God, if you never do anything else in life, I'll be just fine. It's one of those days, and we were inside this time, and I'm in the baptistry, and she comes in the baptistry, and I'd prayed and dreamed about this moment for 15 years, and here it was. And so it's overwhelming to me. The emotions are just overflowing. I am crying like a girl. She's looking at me like a guy. It is an odd situation. And, And to make it meaningful to her, I need to baptize her in Swedish. No big deal, right? My language, her language. But that is something you should tell the deacons before you do that. Yeah. You want to see the quickest deacons meeting you ever had in a Baptist church. You speak in tongues in the baptistry and you see what happens to you. (laughs) And I drop this feeble, frail, 95-pound woman into the water. And she pops up turns to the side and starts dancing. I'm in huge trouble. She's gyrating hips back and forth. She is moving. I've got a dancing Pentecostal in the Holy of Holies, right? The baptistry of a Baptist church the second Sunday I am their pastor. And all I could think was, I wonder what the severance pay is going to be like. (laughs) And I'm I'm wiping the tears from my eyes. and I look up and they're on their feet and they're celebrating. I mean, what would you do if you saw someone who's lost for 90 years of their life and God invaded history to save their soul? I buried her three years later and we grieved, but boy, do we celebrate. For to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord, but for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And we put on her tombstone at the Wood Baptist Cemetery where she's buried. Our favorite verse for her, Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they shall rest from their labors and their works shall follow them. Ultimate question in life is who is Jesus? And I tell you without any reservation, any regret, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you and I have the honor of waking up and worshiping this King of Kings. Would you pray with me? Lord, I know in a crowd like this, there just may be some who say, I don't know this Jesus. He is not real to me. He is not Savior to me. I've never repented my sins. I've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And Lord, for that today, we have this altar call, this invitation, like millions do around the world today, right here. The promise Isaiah 55 is true. Your word never, ever, ever return void. Today, Lord, for any decision needs to be made, maybe it's a Matthew 11 decision and you're calling someone who's never called upon the name of the Lord, say, come unto me, I'll give you rest. Maybe it's someone here who they've been saved. They've been saved for a while, but you know they've never declared it through a believer's baptism. Maybe it's someone who has been saved and baptized, but boy, they don't have a fellowship of believer who loves them and they love them. Maybe today they'll 
place their faith in the fellowship right here at First Baptist. Lord, today, in the few, few moments we have, work within the pews and on this altar. And we'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? As you stand, as we sing, we just have a few moments. Some of the staff will be right here in the front. But if that's you and you've never called on Jesus, this is the time right here. I promise you, he will answer. If you've never been believers baptized, you said, man, that was just me. I've just never been baptized. I've never told anybody. So I'm going to be at the front to share with you this beautiful symbol of salvation of what's already happened in your life. Would you sing?